All right, guys, I'm getting ready to start here. Um, this month, we're going to be covering the conversion from ALIX to APU. Um, though the, the same general principles apply to moving between uh, pretty much any two different pieces of hardware, uh, but we will cover pretty specific things about the ALIX and the APU both. Um, if you don't know, the, the it may show the name Chris on here, but it's really me, Jim Pingle, giving this pre presentation, uh, just like last month. And if uh, you're new to these, uh, these are our monthly hangouts uh, where we just get together. We talk about uh, something PFSense related every month. Um, sometimes they're in-depth, long, like how-to type things. Sometimes they're shorter talks. This one is probably going to be closer to the shorter end of things. And... Uh, We'll see what we can do here. Um, this month, uh, we're going to be covering uh, that transition. Uh, we'll have some project notes, um, some notes specific about the ALIX and the APU, uh, talk about some assumptions we're going to make going into this, uh, the differences between the configurations of the units, uh, things you should do before you start converting, uh, common things you might hit along the way, restoring. Uh, the, the actual configuration that includes, you know, either just doing a straight up restore, or if you have to like pre-edit the interfaces before you convert it over, you can go that way too. Um, and then ultimately deploying the new unit, uh, things to look out for when you actually, you know, plug it in, and make the swap. And again, like I said, these specifically talk, talking about the ALIX to APU, but it really applies to moving between any two uh, platforms aside from the note specific here. All right, first up is our project notes. 2.2 uh, is still in beta, but it's progressing pretty quickly. Um, we did uh, change out the hash algorithm in PF to XX hash for some speed improvements. There's a link there to the blog um, for, for some more details on that. Give a pretty significant speed improvement in packet processing in PF, which uh, everyone's looking forward to. Um, also, uh, since last month, we had uh, the Poodle SSL v3 stuff came out. It doesn't impact us greatly. Uh, it does impact the GUI a bit. It only affects light HTTPD. Uh, we put a fix into 2.2 already to disable SSL v3. Uh, we don't know yet if we're going to uh, do a 216. We might, we might not. or still sort of on the fence there because 2.2 is kind of close. Um, so um, if you're on 215 and you need to disable it, you can uh, follow the directions we posted on the forum. Uh, you can uh, apply the patch from our repository and uh, uh, and then you know, restart your GUI and, and you're okay. It's just a simple one-line change. Uh, for packages like HAProxy and uh, like Apache Mod Security and I think maybe even Squid3 Reverse, I'm not so sure about that one. Uh, they might also support SSL v3, and you might have to look into those to disable those as well. Uh, the forum thread linked for the GUI patch uh, also has a post from the HA proxy maintainer uh, telling you how to disable it there. But it's not a huge concern, uh, you know, for the for the, if you're just running the base system. So, especially if you only have your GUI open internally. Uh, if you have it open to the world, maybe, but yeah, it's a, yet another reason we encourage people to manage their GUI remotely across a VPN and not leave the GUI open to the world. It pretty much negates any possibility of a man-in-the-middle style attack. All right, uh, uh, next we have uh, some notes about the ALIX. Um, it's great for what it was, you know, at the time. Um, but you know it, it's it's had its time uh, these days you know it's been surpassed by lots of things uh, the board itself is going to be end of life in 2015 so there's only so long that we're even going to be able to get these and it passed its end of useful life uh, you know, uh, a while ago um, the amount of ram it has is very low and some models had even less ram uh, which you'll have issues with certain, uh, like if you have multiple open VPN connections, uh, you know, if they all tried to start it, you know, when it booted up, you know, one or more of them may have just outright failed. Uh, it's just not enough RAM for, for what people want to do these days. Uh, and the home internet connection speeds are much higher. The Alix could only handle about 85, 87 megabits per second on a good day with the wind behind it. Uh, but uh, and and encrypted, encrypted traffic was much less. Even if you happen to be using an accelerated cipher, you'd only get maybe 10 to 15, more likely about 10 to 12 uh, megabits per second out of it. Um, and these days, people are getting, you know, 50, 100 megabit connections. Some even have gigabit connections at home, and this, it's just not 
just not feasible. Um, few packages can work on it effectively, largely due to the RAM requirements, but also uh, due to the fact that it could only really run nano BSD unless you uh, hacked it up quite a bit. Now the APU, um, it's made by the same company, PC Engines, uh, but it has a similar form factor, factor to Alix, but it's not 100% identical. Um, if you were hoping to just buy an APU board and slick it, stick it in an old Alix case, it's not going to work. Um, maybe if the Alix was, case would, was produced in the last year or so, but even then it's uh, not, not too likely. It had a slightly different standoff height. Uh, just When you get the thermal uh, pad in there and you screw the board down, if you try to put an APU in an old Alix case, it bends the board and the ports don't line up. It's just not, not good. Not good for anybody. Um, now, with the new case, uh, which it uses the case for passive cooling, uh, there's a uh, the case is basically a giant heat sink, so the case does get quite a bit hotter on the APU than the Alix. The Alix did get pretty pretty warm, but not 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 really hot. But the Alix can can run a bit hot. A little bit more cooling concerns with that. Uh, but you know, the board there's a transfer pad that gets the heat from the board to the case, and then the case radiates the heat out. Now, some people have found that, you know, standing a little bit taller with uh, bigger feet improves the cooling. Some people put it in a, uh, put it in a spot with pretty good airflow. Uh, and it does take a new power supply. The, the barrel connector is a little bit different size because it, it needs more power. And uh, so more likely than not, your old uh, power supply is not going to work. It might, but more likely not. Uh, and we do sell these units in our PSN store with the, with the uh, ID VKT40E. And in the NetGate store, they are APU2 or APU4. Now, these are the fully assembled units that have the OS pre-installed. Um, you can get them either with 2 gig of RAM or 4 gig of RAM on board. There's only like a $20-ish difference between the two models, so very few people opt for the 2 gig uh, that that really, you know, you, you see it, you think, oh, well, a 4 gig of RAM, an extra 2 gig of RAM for 20 bucks, you may as well. Uh, since you can't upgrade it later, you're, uh, you know, it's a good idea to get as much as you can, unless you're real, unless you're ordering a, a very very large number of them where the savings might add up and you really don't need it. Uh, better off getting the bigger RAM. Um, the it runs an uh, an AMD CPU very similar to Atom, sort of roughly the same uh, same class of system. Um, and you can either, either run with an SD card, which is internally attached to the USB bus, which is okay. Uh, or the better option is you can drop an MSATA disk in there. It's got a dedicated MSATA port. Uh, and, and you can use the, a disk that way, an SSD, directly, and it's uh, really nice. So you can run a full install, no problem on that. And uh, it also, in addition to that, has two mini PCI Express slots inside as well. And the, and, uh, the cards just sort of pivot and click in place. You don't have to worry about screws or anything. That's really, really nice. Uh, it does have three Realtek NICs on it, which are not the greatest, but they're still pretty good for most, most deployments. Um, Intel will be better uh, down the road. We'll have some better uh, equipment available uh, that, that does have uh, Intel NICs on it. But uh, at the moment, these are, these are okay. The, the main issue people have with them is you can't force the speed in duplex. So if you're connected to a piece of equipment like a fiber converter or a dodgy cable modem or something that, that your provider has forced to, say, 100 meg full or 10 meg full, um, it, it may not work. You may have to drop a managed switch in there and hard code the managed switch port toward your provider to the right speed and leave the port facing the APU on auto negotiate. Uh, but that's something we're looking into. We're trying to see if we can find a fix for that in the driver. So uh, before we actually get uh, too deep into this, there's some assumptions we're going to make. Uh, I'm assuming your APU already has an installed and working operating system. We're not going to cover how to actually install PFSense onto the APU. Uh, if you purchase the device from us, you know you're already set and ready to go. If you bought it elsewhere, if you bought a kit, um, there's a, there are some uh, forum posts that have uh, procedures for installing it. It's uh, it's not as trivial as installing to the uh, to the older systems. So there there are some concerns there. Uh, also, we're, I'm going to assume that you're the target unit, the APU, is running the most recent firmware image, which is currently PFSense 215. Not going to make a huge difference, but uh, it's just best to, if you're going to move it around anyway, you may as well uh, come up to 215. Uh, versions before 211 probably wouldn't even run on the APU, uh, so it, we're, it's not really going to concern ourselves with the older versions here. Uh, and just to be on the safe side, um, you, you might not need it, but to be safe, it's best to have a serial port, either hardwired or a USB to serial adapter, and an old modem cable handy if you need to console into it. 
Uh, more likely than not, you won't need it, but uh, you know, it's best to have it on hand just in case something does go wrong. And if you're planning a conversion, uh, it's easy to you know grab a uh, grab a USB to serial adapter and an all modem cable around the same time you order the APU. And we're gonna, I think, um, somebody mentioned the other day we might start carrying the USB to serial adapters uh, in the store as well that we we can accommodate people who need those. You can just order everything in one place. All right. Um, some of the main differences in the configuration between these two units. Um, the, the main one that people hit a lot is that the interface order is reversed in the operating system versus how the ports are arranged externally. The external labeling on the cases, at least the cases from, uh, from NetGate and, and our, in the PFSense store are the, the same. However, on the Alix, if you read them left to right, it's VR2, which is your OPT1 port, VR1, which is WAN, and VR0, which is the LAN. On the APU, if you go left to right, same direction, it's the order's flipped. So it's RE0 as OPT1, RE1 as WAN, and RE2 as LAN. I'm not sure, you can, you can blame PC engines for that one. I'm not sure exactly why that was flipped around or if that was intentional or what, but um, that's the the biggest source of confusion people have is they, they go and they think, oh, well, okay, VR2 to RE2, RE0, or, or VR0 to RE0, and, you know, they end up not being able to talk on their LAN simply because the LAN is plugged into the wrong port now. <laughs> uh, so it's just, it was the biggest thing to watch out for. Uh, the serial console speeds, another one to look out for. If you if you bought the Alix or Miniwall from the NetGate or PFSense store, it was sent to you with the serial speed of 38400, and that value is stored in the configuration file. Uh, the APU uh, purchased from us, it comes with a speed of 115200, which is really fast and really good. And if you just installed PFSense, uh, the vanilla PFSense image from uh, from our website, then uh, it was uh, 9600. Uh, that's going to change to a default of 115200 in 2.2, uh, but at the moment it's still 9600. And those are those are stored in the configuration in some places. Uh, other others uh, just have the default, but normally it's stored in the config. So if you take that Alix config and restore it over to the APU and you don't change that first, then your serial console might not connect because you've got it at the wrong speed. When you restore that config, it would knock it down to 38.4. Uh, another big difference is the cryptographic accelerator setting. Uh, the Alix had a GLXSB, the Geode LX security block on board. It could accelerate AES-128 uh, ciphers. Um, or you could have dropped a hyphen card in there to accelerate a lot more ciphers. Uh, the APU currently does not have any viable uh, accelerator, but most of the time it, it's not not needed. Um, some of the newer stuff coming down, the, the Rangely chipset based stuff, uh, we also have like the 7551 and the C2758 in our store. Those have AES&I and Quick Assist, which the 2.2 is going to be able to take some big advantage of those. Um, we've had people running near gigabit uh, on IPsec on, on those, which are uh, pretty nice boxes, uh, which would be a, a step up from these. So if you really need cryptographic acceleration, you probably want to look to a bigger device, not the APU, but more toward the like the C2758 if you can swing it. All right. Uh, now, before you do the actual conversion, uh, there's a few things you can do to make it a lot easier on yourself. Uh, so you you know go to your Alix, and in there uh, under System Advancement miscellaneous, uh, sorry, just system advanced on the first tab there, admin access. Um, if you scroll down to the bottom, change that serial port speed from 115 uh, to 115200. It's probably on 38.4 or 9600 by default. Just uh, knock that up to 115200. And uh, if you can restart it and give it a test to make sure it works at the right speed, that's just gonna make sure that when you move this configuration over, then the serial speed will be consistent. Um, you can leave the packages installed and let it restore the packages when you when you move it over, but trust me, the transition is a lot easier if you take the packages out um, and then uh, and then restore them and, and add them back in manually later. Uh, you, you can get by without it in most cases, but a lot of times when you're doing these conversions, you end up not having the ability to uh, give external connectivity to your new your new unit, and so when you restore it, the packages wouldn't come through anyway. Now you can actually uninstall them, or you could, you know, just uh, back up the configuration and edit out the package tags that show the, the uh, that those packages are installed. 
um, either way. I'm, I'm going to show you a little bit of uh, manual config edit editing uh, later in the presentation when we're talking about the interfaces. I'll just, I'll just go ahead and if I remember, I'll uh, show you some of that as well. Um, so before we actually uh, move it to, you want to deselect any crypto acceleration card you have on there. Um, that would be like if you, if under System Advanced on the Miscellaneous tab, you might have you might have chosen to enable the geo the GLXSB device. Um, you can just set that back to none. It's not necessarily going to hurt anything on the APU since that won't actually engage, but still it's best to uh, to drop that if you don't need it. Okay, and uh, after making those changes, make sure you take a fresh backup from the Alix. Just go to Diagnostics and Backup Restore. Um, technically speaking, you can check the box uh, or uncheck the box to disable the RD uh, exclusion. So you get your RD data in the backup. Um, you could do that and then restore that back to the Alix, it's, or back to the APU. However, it's probably better if you don't. Um, if you are going from 2.0 to 2.1, it's flat out not going to carry over because uh, the Alix is running an i386 platform and the APU would be running AMD64. Uh, so the architecture of the files would be different. Now on 2.1 and later, when you back up your RRD data, it does uh, come through in an in a architecture independent format. So that would be okay. Uh, but if you're going to play it safe, you may as well not include it. But really, it, ultimately, it's up to you. If you want to try it, go ahead. Um, it's not going to hurt anything. It might toss an error and skip over it, but you know, I, I personally I leave it out. It's it's generally not something that's so important. You want to you want to risk having any issues with. And uh, if the APU is running a newer firmware, say your a, say your Alix is running 203 or 21 uh, or 21 release, something a little bit older, or even 123, uh, you want to make sure you review the upgrade guide. And there's a link there on the doc wiki for it. Uh, just docpsense.org slash index.php slash upgrade underscore guide. And there's a big document there. It lists all of the known issues with upgrading from version to version, uh, things to look out for when, when transitioning between, say, 1, 2, 3, and 2, or between 2.0 and 2.1, uh, because, you know, some behavior, some default behaviors changed, and some uh, some things changed during upgrade, and there's, there's some things you got to watch out for. And another important thing is to review the release notes for each new version and all in between. So if you're going from 2.14 to 2.15, it's not a big deal. You can just look at the 2.15 release notes. But if you're going from 1.23 all the way up to 2.15, you might want to take a glance at the 2.0, the 2.01, 2.02, 2.03, 2.1, 2.11, 1, and so on, all the way up to 2.15. Um, not saying you have to read them in depth, but it, if you've waited that long to convert, it's a good idea to familiarize yourself with what has changed from where you were to where you're going. Now, this is a completely optional step. Um, if you've just installed your APU, you probably don't have to worry about it. But if you've been monkeying with it and you want to get back to a fresh start, you can. We're going to be replacing the configuration anywhere. The, the main reason I included this is just because we get a lot of questions about it. Uh, you can factory reset your APU just to get it back to a default configuration if you want. Um, to do that, you can either use the GUI from Diagnostics. Uh, you can go to factory reset and choose it there. Uh, or SSH or serial console is option four if you can reach it that way. Uh, or if you can't reach any of those, um, you can, if this is uh, a, nano, a unit running on SD card purchased from NetGate or PFSense, uh, the front reset button does work. Um, in the next firmware, it'll work on the MSETA disks as well, uh, but we, we found an issue with the reset button on the MSETA disks. It's just, uh, it didn't work in the current firmware, but we have it working in, the, in our test images, so it'll, it'll, be, it'll be working on the next one. Um, so to do that reset with the button, you just you know, take away the power, uh, which is it's always preferable to unplug the APU from the wall or outlet and not at the barrel connector on the back. Um, in the PC Engine's doc uh, describing the APU, they say to do it that way because uh, there's a chance of having an arc or spark between the connector and the and the case when you plug it in straight in the back, which I've seen that happen once or twice, but a lot of people don't see it. I guess it might, it might depend on your environment and the grounding and everything, uh, but... It's just, just play it safe, unplug it at the wall if you can. Uh, just take a paper clip or something similar, uh, push it into the reset button hole in the front. It will give just a little bit, you'll feel it push in. And then keep that held in while you plug the power back in and just hold that in. It can take anywhere from about 30 to 90 seconds to, 
for it to reset. You'll hear the beeps when it comes up. Um, a normal boot, you know, it reaps, it, go, it goes up, it rises, it goes do 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 do, and you can hear it that way. Uh, when the reset occurs, the tones will descend and then rise. So it's like the shutdown sound followed by the start up sound, and then and then it restarts itself. And the, the lights on the front will flash too. Um, when you see, after that happens, you see the tones, you see the flash. Um, you can release the reset button. And then you can either wait, it might restart itself, or you can unplug the power and plug it back in. And um, FYI, aside from the tones, that same procedure works on the Alix to reset. No matter where you got it, the Alix images support the reset button. So you can pull the, uh, if you want to reset your Alix when all is said and done, you can use that same trick on it. And I, I recorded a little short video of that. I'm going to have it available uh, with the files where you can download the Hangout. So when you log into the portal later later today uh, you, or uh, early next week, you should see those images, uh, should see a link to the video if you want it. And we might toss it on YouTube. Um, so it's it's pretty straightforward. And you might not need it for this, but it's something to keep in your back pocket in case you uh, you need it in the future. Okay, so... Uh, the biggest issues we see uh, when restoring configuration from one particular bit of hardware to another uh, are, the, are the ones here we have listed on this page. The, the number one thing is mismatched interfaces. Uh, you restore it, it reboots, and all of a sudden it says you, your interfaces don't match. Or you restore it in the GUI and you don't have enough interfaces or the interfaces don't look right when you try to assign it. Uh, in those cases, it's usually because there are some virtualized interfaces that you've got, or don't have rather, on the new ones. Uh, you're talking like VLANs, uh, maybe wireless interfaces, though it's less common. Um, OpenVPN assigned interfaces, GIF, GRE interfaces that are assigned, maybe PPP interfaces. You can, when you go into the assignment, you can, uh, before you restart, you can actually go in and edit your VLAN tags and reassign the interfaces or, um, uh, or go into the PPPs and edit them there. But it, just finding all of them can be a, a little bit of a chore, which is why a lot of times, unless you have just a basic interface configuration, we, we, we jump right to uh, editing the new interfaces into the config, but we'll get there in a minute. Um, so, you know, if, you can try it. If, it. if it works, great. If it doesn't, then you know, might have to, may have to jump in and, uh, and, and do the manual config edit away. Uh, the serial console settings, people say, oh, well, I restore this configuration, all of a sudden my serial console doesn't work. Well, mostly it's because your uh, uh, because the speed's different. If you didn't do that speed adjustment before you restored it, then, uh, you know, you're probably expecting it to be 115.200 when it's really like 9600 or 38.4 or vice versa. Uh, also, uh, the config XML should have an enable serial tag in it. Uh, if you're using a full install, especially if it's using a nano BSD plus VGA image, or you loaded it manually, um, the the images that we ship from the NetGate and PioSense store have some special code in it to always make sure that those will get this the uh, serial console enabled at all times. But if you used a different image, it might uh, not come through the same way. Uh, also, uh, packages installed during the restore is one of the reasons I, I usually remove them beforehand. Uh, if you don't have an internet connection, then the packages won't be reinstalled. Or, uh, worst case scenario, they might appear to be installed, but they aren't actually, you know, like the binaries are missing, something like that. It's rare for that to happen, but, you know, we, we, we've seen a couple of cases where it has, we haven't been able to track down yet. But uh, it's, it's just better overall to remove the packages and reinstall them afterwards. And uh, something else to watch out for, do not plug the WAN of the APU into the LAN of the ALIX, especially if you're using the uh, 192.168.1 on the backside of the ALIX. The reason for that is in the default configuration, uh, the LAN of your APU will also be 192.168.1, and so you'll have the same subnet on WAN and LAN, which really confuses the device and ultimately uh, ends up you not won't be able to reach the GUI. So if you have it all plugged in and you get an IP from DHCP maybe even, but you can't reach the GUI, that might be the case. So what you can do is just uh, unplug it from the WAN and uh, restart it, and then you should be able to get to the GUI. Now, uh, in... For actually restoring the configuration, first I'm going to look at you know just doing a, a normal typical GUI restore, uh, which is you know just the normal physical interfaces assigned, and you can just go to Diagnostics Backup Restore. Uh, you, uh, just, you just click the Browse button, find your configuration, and click the button to restore it, and it'll take you to the interface assignment page, um, which you can see here. Uh, the interface assignments show up. 
uh, like here on the top is your is the the assignments on the alix before uh, you can see vr1 is the wan vr0 is the lan vr2 is the dmz and my wifi and wi-fi interface is ATHO for the Theros card. Then afterwards, uh, when doing the after you restore, you just pick the new interfaces to assign. It'd be RE1, RE2, RE0, and ATHO. Um, and it's important to note that after you pick the new interface assignments, you have to click the Save button. Do not just jump right up and click Apply Changes because that won't have actually saved your settings. Uh, once you click save, it does apply the new interface assignments and changes the IPs and things. So you might find if your default configuration was 1.2.168.1 and then your restored configuration had 1.2.168.2, for example, on the LAN, well, now your client IP doesn't match the firewall IP, so you might have to um, adjust your client accordingly. Um, or, you know, you could just at that point restart the unit. Uh, if, if you can't reach the GUI, you can always just turn it off and back on at that point. You're okay. Um, so if you after you press save, you can go ahead and press apply changes at, what, at which point it will restart itself. Um, if you do need to make other changes before you before you uh, fix all that up, it's better to leave the interface assignment part alone at first. Maybe go in, edit your VLAN tags, your PPPs, things like that. Make sure they're pointing at the right physical interfaces, and uh, and then uh, come back to the assignments tab, fix the assignments, and press save. Now, after it restarts, it'll come back up with a new configuration. Um, if something goes wrong and it doesn't boot back up all the way, it might be sitting at an assignment prompt, uh, in which case you would have to hook up using a serial console cable uh, to see where it stopped at. It could be stopping, it could have stopped and not been able to locate one of the interfaces, for example. Uh, if for some reason, you know, if, if that doesn't work and it's still, and it, and it, it isn't quite working right and it still didn't go, you could at that point uh, go back to the factory reset procedure, try to reset it, and then start all over and try again. And there was our uh, interface assignments one more time. If you wanted to look, the uh, the before settings from the Alix and how it looked, and then the after, uh, how it looks on the APU. Now, the next... One, which is a little bit more interesting, uh, is pre-editing your configuration file before you restore it. Um, okay. So, like I said, there's many, like I see here, there are many virtual interface types that you can assign. It's Usually it's easier to edit the config XML and a text editor to fix them. Um, you have to use, well, you don't have to. You could you could use WordPad, but I, I personally I don't trust it. Use like I like to use an advanced or programming editor. I, I prefer Ultra Edit, but you could use Notepad plus plus, Kate, Vi or Emacs, you know, things like that. Anything that understands Unix line endings is best, and especially if it can do syntax highlighting or even XML syntax checking can help you a lot. Uh, syntax highlighting uh, is, is a good one for it to do as well. And uh, I believe Notepad++ does that. I know Ultra Edit does, and I know Kate does. Uh, the GUI versions of Vi and Emacs are the ones that have color in the console probably do as well. And what you can do there is search for the old interfaces, like VRO, VR1, VR2, and replace them by the new ones, you know, RE2, RE1, and RE0. But whatever you do, do not auto-replace, because there are times when you might have something like a VR0 in the middle of some other string, like a, a base64 encoded certificate or something, and you don't want to you don't want to break that. So you need you can do a search and replace, but look at each match, visually inspect it, make sure it's actually what you want to do. Um, so and then after you edit, and and then visually inspect it, make sure everything is good, and then after you edit, you can save that file and then just go and restore it in the GUI, and it should be happy and restart itself. Okay. Here's just a visual example of what it looks like um, to see the, uh, the what kind of configuration edits you, you might need to do. Uh, There's just a quick example of VLAN and PPP tags. You can see here in the V. I had to look through the configuration, find the VLANs tag, and there's a, the interface of the first VLAN tag 22. There was VR0. I had to change it to RE2. And same down in the VLAN if, had to change VR0 all the way over to RE2. And then it had a PPPoE connection that I changed from VR1 to RE1. Now, let's see if I can get this to show up over here. Um, oh, I was going to show you quickly in a text editor. 
just an old Alix config I've got here. And if I do a search and replace, for say VR0 to RE2, if I click next, it'll, it'll show it down there. See, it found VR0. I can see plainly that that is the right interface that I want to do. So I hit replace. It jumps in. Oh, look, that's bad. That's in the middle of a certificate. It's a good thing I didn't actually do that. So next, find the next one. Yeah, that one too. That's no good. And one more in the middle of a certificate. No, 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 no. Nope, that's it. Got to the bottom. It was all, the only place that was in there was just up in the top in the interfaces section. And uh, another part I mentioned was uh, removing the packages. Um, there's a couple different ways you can do that. Uh, the, you can, one of the good ways here is in, in, a, in the text editor, if you look for the packages section, so I just did a, I just did a find for the packages tag. And you can see that here. I didn't find it there. Oh, it's package, not packages, sorry. It's installed packages or package. And see, look here, I've got the sudo package installed. And if I want to get rid of that, um, at the very least, I can take out this package to the close package tag. Um, to be extra complete, I also take out, you know, it's got uh, a menu entry here I can take out. There might be tabs or service entries, things like that, that you could get rid of as well if you wanted to. Um, if you're going to be reinstalling the package, those are not so critical. The, the package tag itself is what you want to get rid of. And then I could just save that. And then when it restores, it wouldn't have that package in it. And so there you see. And it, the configuration file, it's all just plain text XML. It's nothing to be too scared about. You need to be careful, but it's, you know, you, as long as you make sure you're doing the right things there. And, and this is something too, where if you if you need some help with a, a simple conversion like that, and you bought it from us, the you know your the the support you've got included with the unit should uh, cover some simple things like that. We can we can definitely uh, help you out if you, if you need it. Uh, more often than not, these things go pretty smoothly. So uh, just to be aware of these pitfalls, and you're fine. Oh, there's just the meeting details here. And now if we were back here, all right, let's see my portal background there. And again, just back here showing you the, the VLAN uh, and uh, the VLAN and PPP tags that we changed. All right, so um, now that the configuration has been restored, there's just a couple more little things we need to poke at. Uh, for the pre-deployment, just things to make sure, to, just like a pre-flight check to make sure before you actually try to do the swap, some things you need to look out for. Uh, the first thing to do is, you know, boot it up with the new configuration after you restore and just, you know, go through all the areas that you know are important to you to make sure everything is there and it looks all right. Um, look, check your check what you've got against what things that were noted in the upgrade guide. Um, and if they've been handled, you know, just make sure they apply. Uh, if they even apply to you, just make sure you, you've accounted for them. Um, or, you know, make sure any virtual interfaces you had assigned are still there and they're still right. So if you go to interfaces assigned, make sure you're, like, if you had assigned open VPNs, make sure they're there. Make sure your VLAN tags exist and they're right, they look they're right on the right interfaces and that they're assigned right, that kind of stuff. Um, if you can get an external address for your APU, like say it's on DHCP and you can get multiple IPs in your WAN, or you have a second IP you can put in the, on there temporarily, you can get it connected out uh, in a way that won't conflict and uh, and reinstall your packages beforehand. Otherwise, you have to do that after deployment, which uh, if you've got a maintenance window, it's not a big deal, but some people try to do these things, you know, like over a lunch break or something, that not a very long thing, and they, they, they might miss things. And it, it's best to best to do it before if you can, but if you can't, you can always do it after you deploy. Uh, and uh, also just you know, quickly visit status RD graphs. Make sure the RD graphs are drawing data for you, uh, and that and if you if you did try to restore them, you'd see your old data. Otherwise, uh, you can do a, do a, a reset of the RD data on the settings tab inside the inside of uh, status RD graphs. 
that will uh, clear the data out and start your graphs fresh. If they are not working, then that will make them work. Um, now, uh, we, another thing you can do at this point is under System Advanced on the Miscellaneous tab, on the thermal sensors, you can select AMD Temp, uh, and that will uh, activate the temperature monitoring. You can on the dashboard, you can go and add the uh, the thermal sensors widget, and it'll show the the temperature readout from both cores on there. So. That's handy to have, especially since on the APU you want to just be on the lookout to watch the temperature. It does run a little high, um, so but if you see it getting extremely high, you can set up some sort of uh, alternative cooling for it. And now uh, the last bit we need to look at here is actually deploying it. Um, so uh, at that point, you just uh, take the you know take the Alex out, unplug it, uh, plug in the APU, uh, connect all the cables back up. You know the the same interface, the same cables to the same interfaces. Um, now your most common issue actually deploying it is probably going to be ARP issues. Uh, ARP caches on things can be uh, pretty brutal sometimes uh, because the MAC addresses of the the unit are different. Um, you can sort of get around that by spoofing the MAC addresses of the Alix, but it's best to avoid that if at all possible. It's kind of an ugly thing to do. Um, ARP issues, they, they are kind of annoying, but they're usually not that hard to work around. Like you might have to power off your cable modem, power it back on, maybe reboot a switch, um, maybe restart a workstation. Um, what I've seen some people do as well is they, they'll install Nmap and do like an ARP sweep of the entire network or ping the broadcast address and just sort of, I, it will send out a gratuitous ARP when it comes back up, but sometimes things need a little bit of extra nudging to update the MAC address. So. Uh, some things are workstations or switches you might need to reboot, but it, it's better to go that route than it would be to spoof. Spoofing looks like an easier transition, but in the end, it's it's not really helping you a whole lot. Um, and you know, after you've got all that handled, uh, just you know, check your gateway status, make sure it shows online, to, so you know your WAN's working uh, from the LAN. Make sure you can get out to the internet, you know, or whatever you needed to do before. Uh, you might check your VPNs, make sure you can reach any other remote sites that you need to. Um, if you can, if you had a remote access VPN, you might test that from the outside as well. Um, you know, check your packages, make sure everything is there. In particular, Squid and Snort things, or Squid Guard really, and, and Snort are things you might want to look at because um, when they install them, they might actually have to go in and force a rule update, or in the case of Squid Guard, you might have to force a blacklist update to make sure it's got its data. Uh, otherwise, you might run afoul of. Uh, uh, of those that might appear to come up, but they might actually run or they might not, they might actually fail to start and you might not be able to get out. Um, then after that, you know, test port forwards, anything else you have going, uh, make sure it's okay. And um, after that, you can go through, either make any other changes you want, you know, I said salt the taste and enjoy. That's really, that's really uh, all, about all there is to it. And uh, that's it for that one. Um, are there any questions anybody has? You can uh, type them in the chat. There's one from Josh. Any time, any development time be spent on lowering the memory usage from now on, or is the answer to out of memory problems to get the AVU? Um, the there are, there is still some work going on uh, in 2.2. PHP FPM has lowered the memory requirements a bit. Uh, but there's really only so much we can do. It's not just uh, things that we control. There's other daemons and things that we, that we run that, that have grown in size as well. Um, you know, it, the, it's just, it's something to be on the lookout for, but really most platforms are coming with two or four gigs. So um, I don't know, there's only so long we can accommodate accommodate the Alix uh, in terms of new versions. Eventually the, the new stuff's just not going to run on it, uh, just, just flat out. Uh, from Bob asking what temp is too high. Uh, you would know that. <laughs> I don't remember the exact high temperature. Uh, let me see what that was. I can't remember which one it was. Um, I know it's usually in the, I think it was, was it 60? 70 C. That's what it was. Well, the high 60s is what I was thinking. 70 C. Um, Bob is one of our other uh, support guys who deals a lot more with those uh, hardware type of questions, uh, specifically about the APU. Um, so yeah, 70C, if it gets above 70C, be on the lookout. Uh, 
any other questions? I know it's uh, Um, that just a reminder, uh, a video copy of this along with the slides will be available on the portal site either later today or, or early Monday. And I'm going to get you a, a copy of that uh, reset video as well. Oh, uh, Matthew, any fix for the set Kern Cam boot delay 10,000 normal PS install? No, you, you will have to do that. Um, I don't know. I don't think that's something we're going to bake into the default because it, it adds an unnecessary delay for some platforms. Um, but it's just, uh, you know, something you just have to break into the loader at the console and do it's an, it's an, it's one of the just one of the things that, that are going to be a part of the uh instructions for getting it going on this unit for now it's just and that's only relevant to the sd card uh because it's connected to the usb bus or well b bus said it's a little redundant there but it's only if it's connected to usb uh because the sd card is on the usb uh, portion of their it you know it needs that delay to be able to detect the the card and the, the rest of the USB devices properly before it tries to mount. Uh, if you're running on the MSATA, you don't have to worry about that. Which, truth be told, honestly, the MSATA presses are pretty pretty cheap. You, you'd be better off running a full install on a good MSATA than you would be trying to shoehorn it onto an SD card, given the choice. I would, I'd, I'd go with an MSATA. Especially given that it's connected to the SATA bus and not USB. I know USB works pretty good, I just don't... Uh, yeah, it's also, yes, MSA is a thousand times faster. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's also, I, I, we've had no problems, no reported problems at all with SD card, the SD card or the USB bus on the, on the APU. But, you know, historically, the, the USB is, has not been as reliable as the SATA bus. I, I, I don't have any qualms about running on SD cards. I just prefer the MSATA. What is the best throughput for the real tech card? Um, we have not done any official numbers on those. Um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 400, 500 megabits per second, probably a little bit more than that. It might be a little bit less, depends on your payload. I, I don't, we don't really have any solid numbers that we can really put any weight behind. It's, uh, we're, we're in the middle of getting our test lab built out to where we can get uh, reliable, repeatable numbers and method methodology that we can publish. Uh, Nate mentioned he had two consumer-grade SD cards die from overheating, which is another concern, uh, especially given that the APU runs pretty hot. We we, we ship them with some pretty high-quality SD cards. I'm not sure that'd be a a, a big concern there, but uh, if you're if you're just sourcing these parts individually and you grab happen to grab one, uh, it might be something you might need to worry about. All right, anybody else? Anything else? Any other questions? Oh, there's Matthew. He said he's got 350 to 400 megabits per second on Google Fiber, uh, which that's pretty good speed. Um, it, the the real techniques are nice, but they're they're not as they're not as good as Intel, and uh, it's hard to tell what your uh, what kind of bottleneck you're hitting hitting on that. But you might be able to squeeze a little bit more out of that. It depends. Let's see if I missed any questions here. I'm just going back through the chat buffer that in this other window here. Yeah. Nope. All right. I think that's it. Okay, everybody. Um, oh, yeah. Bob said use Tier 1 MSATA. Yeah, so definitely, if you're going to buy an MSATA, make sure you get a good one, uh, especially if you can find one that has a power loss protection capacitor. Those are excellent. Uh, the Intel series, the Intel line are are really good. That's what we that's what that's what we stand by. So, all right, all right, everybody. Uh, we still there's still one more makeout hangout we need to squeeze in. Um, now that we should ho hopefully be able to do that. I don't know if we'll be able to do it yet in October. There's only a couple of days left, but uh, we still need to get an extra one in next month, maybe. Uh, but uh, if you have any topics that you'd like for a future Hangout, uh, post them on the forum. Just start a new forum thread somewhere, probably general discussion, um, or reply to the Hangout thread here. Uh, it's in the uh, 
uh, like the announcement board or the messages from the, from the PFSense team board. Uh, you can reply on there. Just give us some good suggestions, and uh, we'll see what we can find out. Especially, in, it doesn't have to be a long or involved topic. Something like this, it, did, it it didn't take us that long to get through. It's a we like to keep things a little bit shorter. The longer presentations are a little bit tougher on us to do every month, and also to you know to keep current and to in terms of actually, you know, taking the time and giving them. So these short ones work out really well. Uh, they, we can uh, we can knock these out pretty good. So if you have any topics, feel free to submit them, and uh, we'll see you next month.